Hey, welcome to the Elijah Rising podcast. Elijah Rising is an organization empowering women recovering from sexual exploitation. This episode is going to help you become more informed about the issue of sex trafficking and inspire you to take action. Hey, welcome to the Elijah Rising podcast. The first podcast episode of 2021. We made it. We're so excited that you're here with us. And today on the podcast, uh, we are discussing how Elijah Rising reaches trafficked women through our weekly intervention and outreach. And today I'm very honored to be joined on the podcast by the one and only <laughs> Melody <laughs> Jacobs. She is our office administrator and longtime volunteer and intervention yep. specialist. Welcome, Melody. Thank you for having me. So happy to have you on the podcast today. So I want to make a little bit of space at the beginning here for you to introduce yourself. I think I could do a little bit of it, but I think it would be a lot more fun if you tell us who you are and you tell the audience who you are. So who are you, Melody? So I am a mom. I am a, a pastor. I have five beautiful children. I have many spiritual children. So I'm very much that mama bear. Yeah. Um, I'm muscular Apache. I'm Native American, and my husband is Seminole Creek. So my kids are registered with the Seminole Nation, and we woke up Oklahoma. Yeah. So we have five of them, and we, you know, yeah, that's that's who we are. Yeah. So you, you do a lot of driving. Uh, the other day, I came down to your office, and like the ISD was calling, and so you do a lot of mom stuff. And so I get the sense that you're very proud of that, though. Yes, yes. I think that that is our first and foremost ministry mm. as parents. You know, um, to raise up the next generation. Yeah, yeah. Um, I always tell my the leaders who I that are under me, the spiritual children, my own kids, that I want to raise you up, that if I drop dead tomorrow, mm. that you can step right into my shoes and run and run even farther. Wow. So my ceiling is their floor, yeah. always. Awesome. So, that's, yeah. that's, that sounds pretty Christ-like of you. That's, that sounds pretty <laughs> biblical. <laughs> so, um, well, we asked Melody to join us on the podcast today because, as I said earlier or just a minute ago, you know, we want to talk about intervention today, specifically how Elijah Rising goes about intervention. You know, um, since about 2011, Elijah Rising has been sending teams of volunteers and staff, for that matter, out on a weekly basis um, on direct outreach and direct intervention, really with the goal of meeting um, victims, men, women, whomever, uh, uh, victims of commercial sexual exploitation right where they are being trafficked. So mm -hmm. like if they are in a brothel, if they're in a strip club, if they're on the streets, we want to meet them right where they are. We want to offer them resources and a hotline number, uh, prayer. And I think more importantly, or most importantly, I should say, just the love of Christ. Yes, and so absolutely. we thought it was about time that we explained how we do that, like practically, and you've been doing that for a while. So why don't you tell the listeners and the viewers, like how long have you been engaged in that type of work? Um, whether that's just street outreach in general, but more specifically, you know, to trafficked people. And, and maybe the follow-up question to that is like, why? Like you got five kids at home, you have a husband, you, you have, you, you were doing pastoral ministry. You've, mm -hmm. You have so much going on in your life, Melody, like how long have you been doing this and why are you doing it? So me and my husband have been um, like in the urban setting ministry, which can cover a number of areas as yeah. far as like homeless, yeah. you know, uh, this, this type of ministry outreach for about 15 years. 15 years? Mm -hmm. For wow. about 15 years. We actually cut our teeth yeah. in New Orleans okay. <laughs> in ministry. That was like our first pastor gig so yeah, yeah, like yeah. in the heart of New Orleans. So you can't get any uh, more urban than that in this area. So it sounds like like your whole history of ministry has really been around being on the street. Yeah. Yeah. yeah wow. Exactly. Well, and then I had one of my young adults uh, when we were at one of the former churches we were that were wanting to come. They told me about Elijah Risen, mm. and she was like, "I want to go." They they do this style of ministry, and but I am terrified to do that on my own. Will you yeah. go with me? I was like, "Absolutely." Yeah, I'd actually done a little bit. I'd went out with a. a ministry that went into the strip clubs in New Orleans. So I was a little comfortable with it. Sure. So we went and that's how I got involved with you guys. And so that was probably around four or five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So that just, um, in New Orleans, when I went to that club, that really captured my heart. Hmm. 
I saw the light of God just flood into like the darkest place and I was hooked, you know, it's just that, you know, I do have that question like, oh, why, why? Do you do that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you mean like you ask yourself, like, why am I doing this? Is that what you mean? Or, or, or you're saying like people ask you people a lot of ask. times, like, why are you going yeah. to strip clubs on Fridays? Yeah, yeah. Whenever, when I'm pulling up my GPS and there's a list of strip clubs, right. Right. <laughs> you yeah. know, like why? Yeah. So, um, it's where I see Jesus. Wow. You know, it's where you feel or where I feel Jesus the most yeah. whenever I've had so many encounters And, you know, our heart is to run after him and we go where he is. Mm -hmm. And so when we're in those places where there's lost and broken people and even the darkest of places, I feel like I can, I, I see him more. Mm -hmm. I hear more of his compassion very clearly for those, their destiny, their identity, Yeah, you know? So it's just, it, it captured me. It's where my heart is. Yeah. And I know your husband goes with you too. I mean, the first time we ever met, we were actually, um, going on intervention together, you were going to the strip club, I was going to the cantinas. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, like this husband and wife couple is going out doing this together. But then, you know, I introduced myself and then you were like, yeah, hey, I'm Melody, I'm a young adult pastor. And you're like, and here's all the young adults I brought with me too. I was like, man, this couple is not only doing this together, like as a family, but you're also those spiritual sons and daughters as well. Like you're also like bringing along Mm -hmm. another generation to do it. And so I wonder, like, would you say that this type of work, like being in that strip club has helped, um, like increase your faith, like increase your relationship with Christ? I I just, I hear you say that you see Jesus more there, that you hear him more there. Yeah, I definitely feel like it is an increase in faith, especially whenever you see, you know, he said, Jesus said, like, you'll see these things and greater. Yeah, yeah. You know, we read, I, I remember whenever I first started to like go to ministry school and there was this book called God's Generals and, mm-hmm. and it's all of this stuff where all these people are doing these amazing exploits for Jesus. And I literally took the book and I threw it across the room. Oh, wow. Because I was like, this gives me the wants and I don't ever see it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and I just the that actually started a dialogue with me and the Holy Spirit, and and as I found those places where I started to see hmm. what I was reading about in the scriptures and see what I was reading about in these um, these generals of the faith, yeah, you know, it just it captured my heart. I'm like, okay, so you don't want us just sitting on the couch, yeah sitting around or just which church is not bad, but just sitting in a church setting. You yeah. actually, you want us in those places and where the broken and the lost, and I'm not saying that church does not have sure. those, yeah. but for me, you know, as part of the body of Christ, I know that he has called me to those areas. He might not have called everyone to those. Yeah. We're all called to go, therefore go and evangelize, tell people about the gospel. Right. But that might look different. I know for me, this is that area that yeah. I'm called to. Yeah. Yeah. And that's important because that's what's going to get you out on the street the next week after the week prior was difficult, or, you know, maybe you didn't have a lot of responses the week prior or, you know, whatever the case It's mm-hmm. that passion. It's that call that you are sounds like you're very well in touch with that keeps you going back Absolutely. week after week for 15 plus years. So I wonder, um, that's so powerful. I, I just appreciate your personal testimony there. And, and I hope our listeners do too, but let's, let's kind of shift gears a little bit. Um, so what does it look like? Like w- how does intervention work? Like what, what does a night on the street? So if I'm a first time volunteer with Elijah Rice and going out on intervention and I get put on Melody's team, like what? And we're going to the strip club. Now I'm a dude and I wouldn't go into a strip club. There are rules around that, but you get what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Like, what does that, what does it look like? How does it work? Well, it is a little different for each intervention okay. site, you know, strip yeah, yeah. club, street team. Um, if you were um, a woman, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then you would be on my strip club team. Sure. And basically we would get in the car, drive to the clubs with, um, 
first, the ones that we've kind of built a relationship with, which mm. I know that sounds kind of odd, but this that that looks like us. We've already met with the managers. They've they, they know, know who we are. They're going to bring us into the back or they're going to let us walk around. Yeah. Uh, mostly it's just in the back of the clubs. Yeah. There's very few where they let you actually on the floor where the girls are dancing and there's customers. Sometimes they do. Yeah. But um, we would be in the car. I would kind of give a little bit of instruction like, hey, you know, you're going to see things that you normally don't see. Put it in your head right now. Yeah. Like just... I'm going to look at people's faces. Yeah, eyes up. <laughs> eyes yeah, up. Yeah. Um, you're not going to leave and be the Lone Ranger. Right. Uh, Jesus sent them out two by two. We're going to stay, stay two by two. Yeah. You know, um, we are going to hand out gifts. We are going to talk to the girls as if we are sitting in a coffee shop. Yeah, yeah. You know, because that's super important. You have to treat them like they're real human beings. Abs- they, yes, absolutely. They are. You know, so um, I pray. Like I always say, like, if you're smart, <laughs> every intervention starts with prayer, yeah, you know? Right, right. Um, so we pray, we go in. As a leader, I go and I talk to the manager, maybe bring them a gift. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just keep that door open. Uh, we'll go in the back, start walking around in pairs. Hey, do you want a gift? Mm-hmm. How is your night going? My name, I always introduce myself. Hmm. You are not a project. Yeah. You are valuable enough for me to have a relationship with. If Jesus wants a relationship with these women, we should want a relationship with these women. Absolutely. They are not a project. Yeah. So we sit down, we talk to them. Sometimes there's this place where we can say, like, hey, let's pray for you. And sometimes you have to just build those relationships. Right. Um, if there's someone who looks like they're being trafficked, mm-hmm. hey. You know, can can you you find that avenue? God has always been gracious to open up the door for us to ask in a gentle and considerate way. Right, right. You know, or, do you need help? Can I give you a phone number? Mm-hmm. You know, it's okay. We might be the only face in that club or on the street that has a voice, a face of hope and a voice yeah. that says you can have something different. Yeah. You know, and that's so important. So not only do we we touch base with like, hey, can we spiritually help you? But we are also looking for those vital opportunities where we can also physically help. Yeah, yeah. You know, so that's super important. Yeah, two things that you said there that really stood out to me was like you emphasized relationship a lot. Like if, and I think that you're, what a great quote. You're like, if Jesus wants a relationship with these people, like how could we not want a relationship? Like, and I I personally believe like all things kingdom go forward through relationship. And it's so critical to remember that like, you're not just some evangelist out there. Like you're a human being, they're human being. And there's a very real connection that can be made. Mm -hmm. You might be in totally different lifestyles, Mm -hmm. totally different places, totally different backgrounds, but the connection there face to face Hi, I'm Melody. Hi, I'm Adam. It really does bridge a lot of gaps. Um, it does. And I also heard you talk about gifts a lot. What What's up with that? Why Why are you handing out all these <laughs> gifts? What's 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 going on there? First and foremost, it's a fantastic icebreaker. Of course, like yeah. who doesn't want a gift? You want something for free? Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. want some eyelashes? Yeah. <laughs> you want a bath bomb? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yes, I want a gift. <laughs> So, so they're normally pretty receptive to oh, receiving the gifts. Yes, absolutely. It's a wonderful icebreaker for them and for us. Yeah. Because not everyone does this on a weekly basis. Sure. You know, we do have people who, hey, I want to do this. I've never done it before. And and this is a great avenue for us to open up a, um, a conversation with people. Yeah. Two, these women always have something being taken away from them. Mm. You know, whether they're on the street selling themselves that's that's something being taken away. If if they are given something, say like cash, yeah. they're giving it. They're it's being bought with a heavy price. Yeah. So what a beautiful thing and example for us to go in there and give a free gift, no strings attached. You don't have to talk to me. I don't have to pray for you. Yeah. Right. I just want right. to bless you. I want you to see that I can give you something, and I I want nothing from you in return. Yeah. So I, I feel like even that is a part of the Lord's heart. Yeah, I mean, that's what 
God's done for us, you know, exactly. and so you're just, mm-hmm. you're re you're representing that you're representing that just in the back of a strip club. How receptive, uh, the other thing I think our viewers and listeners might be wondering is like, what, so like, wait, the managers of these places, like, <laughs> let you do this, how, just briefly, like how and why, like, like, why would a manager ever allow you and three other women to go hang out in the back of a strip club and talk to the, you know, their, their women? Well, I personally love the scripture that says he God turns the head of kings. And I know mm. that they're not kings, but they are kings of their little kingdom. Oh, they're holding a lot of power. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, in those moments, sure. So I feel like the Lord just pours out that supernatural favor and mm. grace. Yeah. I, there, there are many reasons like, oh, I'm glad that you're doing this for the girls. It keeps their morale up. Or, ooh, mm. can we, we can say that we have people coming in and, and so... It's it's a little distorted, but it's it's a healthy kind of work environment, sure. which you can't have in that. But right. this is their thought process. Me, I totally believe it's God turning the head of kings. Mm, wow! You know, we've um, we've walked into places uh, actually. Uh, right before we had to stop because of the pandemic, mm-hmm. uh, we walked into this club and we had never been there before. Uh, the women, I, I wasn't able to go the month before, but the women, uh, the group of women had went and they really felt not to go in. They actually felt just because it was a new club, they felt just to pray in the parking lot. So they prayed in the parking lot until they felt like, okay, we're good. And yeah. they left. Well, the next month I was able to go and they told me, but I was like, well, let's, let's go. You know, I'm totally willing to go in Sure. now. I feel like you can use your discernment. You don't have to, it it doesn't make you not brave. If you get warned by the Holy spirit to not go in there. Great point. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, we got there. I'm like, yeah, nope. I'm feeling it. Let's go in. And it was wonderful. Mm. They were so happy to see us. They were like, yeah, absolutely. (laughs) So, you know, you have this group of ladies. We're walking in the back, and I'm like, trust in Jesus the whole time because I don't know where they're leading us. Sure, It's just like a random place. It's dark. And so we go in. We walk into the back. We we got to the back safely. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And the girls were super excited. It was one's birthday. We, um, We all, like, we had this huge huge circle and we were just praying and actually prophesying over each one. Wow. You know, we were able to hand out some information for girls who like a lot of them were like, well, we're, we're good, but we know someone. So yeah. I hand them some information that if they wanted to change a, a lifestyle change, yeah. usually I approach cause I like to be um, considerate and God is the guardian of our dignity. Yeah. So yeah. like I always approach it like, do you want a lifestyle change? Mm-hmm. You know, that way I'm not using terminology yeah. that could be. Yeah. Like you're being trafficked. You need to get out right exactly. now. Yeah, like right, I don't want right. to shame yeah. anyone. Yeah. Right. That's already been done. Mm. You know, so I always approach it with like, you know what? Do you, do you want a lifestyle change? Yeah. We can yeah. help you with that. Yeah. It's powerful. It's powerful. We're going to take a break in the podcast um, and we'll be back on the other side. When we began to face the issue of sex trafficking, we were devastated by the number of survivors who struggled to find lasting and safe employment. We realized that a major part of the recovery process had to be economic empowerment. The women that we serve have survived immense harm, but their resilience and strength inspire us every day. These women are creators, innovators, and visionaries. They deserve the freedom to thrive and pursue their greatness. At Elijah Rising, we create hand-built goods that empower women who have survived human trafficking. We know that you're gonna love what we make at Elijah Rising Goods because we believe in the goods that we create and we believe in the amazing women that produce them. Welcome back to the podcast, Melody. Um, I feel like the first half of this episode was so powerful. We were just saying in the break, like you had us hooked. Like I was like, "What's next?" Um, and I know you can tell a million stories. We're going to ask you to tell a you know a story here in a minute. But I think it's important to d- like just establish right now, like what's the point here? 
Like, what is the point of this outreach? What's the point of, of doing intervention? Because as I said, Elijah Rising, we've been committed to this literally since our inception. For, for 10 years, we've been doing this. So in your mind, as somebody who's participated for almost five years, almost half that time, like, what? why are we doing this? Is it to break up trafficking rings? Is it to save lost souls? Is it to stop buyers? Like, why? What's the point here? It's to do all those things. Okay, great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> She's like, yes and more. Yes. <laughs> but the core of that, the yeah. heartbeat of that is the scripture he came to set the captives free. Mm. You know, um, whether you're in front of a pimp, a buyer, sure. a, a woman who is working the streets, a woman who is dancing in the clubs, brothels, massage, you name it. You are looking at someone who is captive to a destructive lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. And that was not the intention of the creator Yeah. when he thought and fashioned them before the very foundations of the earth. Because yeah. we know Ephesians says that he fashioned. It was his good pleasure, mm. you know, to think Absolutely. of us. So we want to be either the, the point of where, say, a woman can can start to have access to resources to exit. Yeah, right. We want to be the catalyst and maybe her thinking like, hey, there's another way. Yeah, there, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We want to be the catalyst in a buyer's mind of, hey, you know what? These are, this is someone's daughter. Mm. And, and we're not saying when when we say we talk to buyers, we're not saying that out of judgment. We're never yelling at them. It yeah. is always with love because it's vitally important that love is at the forefront of your your thoughts of the way you see yeah everyone involved um because without love you're a clanging bell <laughs> so so you you have to keep that in mind absolutely yeah. and they're they're lost like you were once lost yeah and so we should go out there with this this commission this mission to say hey I was once captive and now I am free. Yeah. Right. And 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 I have the the gospel, the good news that can help you spiritually and physically. Right, right. Become free. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's so important like you bring up a really good point. And I don't know if we've talked about it on the podcast before. I'm sure we have, but like even the buyers, even the pimps, like they're human beings too. Mm-hmm. Right? And 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 they might not be the one that are that are like trapped in the sex commercial sexual exploitation, but they are captives too. Absolutely. They're trapped too. And we do so it's important to remember, like we do um sometimes have the opportunity to talk to them as well when we're on outreach, whether that's on the street or in the clubs or in the in the brothels. Um and I wonder if uh, it's kind of a it's kind of a turn that we didn't plan for, but like I wonder if you can think of a time where you had an opportunity to talk to a buyer or a pimp or somebody or an exploiter of some kind. I mean, have you ever experienced a time of like where you had the opportunity to talk to them and you saw a moment of breakthrough or you saw a moment of um, them considering, well, maybe I should get back in my car and turn around, or maybe I should not make this decision tonight. I, I have a. A couple. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, just last Friday, we talked to that. No. Yeah. But um, actually, there's one, and our Liesl was with us yeah. on this one. So we had gotten into this club, and it was literally the first time, and the manager was super hesitant, but I was I was being, like, super persuasive, like, come on, let yeah. us in. <laughs> come on, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he let us in. It was wonderful. We're walking out, hmm. and this guy is in his truck, and he's like, hey. Hey. And so I walked over to him. I'm like, Hey, what's up, man? And he was like, how is it in there? Is it good? And I'm like, I had this moment of like this interstellar war of, Oh God, yeah. what do I tell him? Cause if I'm like, get out of here, right, you know, what are right. you talking about? He could have went in there and told the manager like, Hey, I had this, yeah. some woman is yelling at me and that would have killed. Right. Cause you're messing with this business now. Right. Yeah. yeah. That would have killed our chances of getting in again. Yeah. But then I'm not going to tell him like, Oh yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Awesome. Yeah. You know, to, to, I could tell, I have to trust God a little bit more than that. Yeah. You know, um, we always have to stick. We cannot compromise on the authentic authenticity of truth. Mm. Okay. That, that is, uh, Side note, you yeah. know, never 
water it down to stay connected. You have to trust God and you yeah. have to be truthful. Yeah. So I, I'm looking at him for a minute and I'm like, look, I'm going to be super honest with you. We're in there to pray for those girls. Mm. You know, you just we, told him straight up. Exactly. I was like, I can't tell you that it's good in there. Yeah. I literally, t- I was like, I can't tell you that. And he was like, oh, so, so what are y'all doing? So I was like, we, he was like, why are you guys in there? I'm like, cause we love them and mm. we think they're valuable. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's good in there. And, and Liesl was right there. And so she even brought some more to the table and I'm not going to try to reiterate it. Cause I don't remember. I don't sure. Sure. Put words in her mouth. But it was perfect. I know that much. It was perfect. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> it totally worked. So me and Lisa walked away, and I'm just praying like, oh, Jesus, mm. please don't let him go in there and tell the manager that we encountered him in the yeah. parking lot. So we're sitting there for a minute in the car, and I'm kind of taking a little bit of notes, and and we see him start his truck and drive away. Yeah. And And – just to backtrack a little bit, when I was talking to him, I asked him, I'm like, what are you doing? What you doing in Houston? Mm. You know, you said you were from Austin and he's talking about how he was picking up a, you know, I don't want to get into too much detail, sure, sure. but yeah. he, he told me a little bit about his personal life. And I feel like in that moment, it kind of reminded him yeah. like you're out of town and you're thinking you can do this, but Hey, you have yeah. a family. Yeah. There's a, you have a life somewhere else. You have a life somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And this is mm-hmm. not a good option for yeah. you. So yeah. yeah, we have had encounters like that. I could tell you mo- just last Friday, some guy drove in and was like, what's going on here? I'm like, really? Yeah. But it's, but when he said it, he literally, like I could see the little boy within him, mm. you know, like, like, where did something go wrong to mm. where you feel like one, you have to lie two you have to even be in this area sure. looking for what you're looking for. Yeah. I was able to pray for him. And it's funny because he's like, he rolled down his window. He totally put his hand out, which, you know, in these times in day and age, people don't normally do. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Grabbed his hand and prayed for him. Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> so, so we, yeah, we, we touch everyone. You have to give the Lord room to do what he's going to do. Yeah. I'm not going to put boundaries on who he wants me to speak yeah. to. Yeah. It's incredible. Um, I know I just got you to give us a couple stories, but, um, as I, as I said, I want to pay off on the promise. I wonder if there's one favorite story from, from your time or one story that you think, uh, could really make an impact, especially for those who are listening. Like, I, I, I really think that there are some that are listening or watching this podcast right now. They're thinking like, wow, Melody is such an incredible person. I don't think I could ever do that. Or like, I, I don't think I could ever, you know, uh, be as brave as her or I, or if I went out, like, I bet it wouldn't be as impactful. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if there's a story, uh, a testimony that you could tell that w- that could just, you know, encourage that, mm-hmm. that, that shows, I mean, you've already kind of shared some, but that, w- that could just show <laughs> the power of, um, of, of God and a breakthrough in this type of work. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Real quick, before I get into that, yeah, yeah. I just, I would like to tell the audience that like, when I first got saved, I would break out into like a cold sweat when mm-hmm. I felt like the Lord wanted me to pray for another person in church. Yeah, like like, like down <laughs> like, the aisle. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I was like, no, that's not what we do, Lord. Yeah, so if yeah. God can take me from that place, and, and really it's a trust issue. Mm. You know, if, if he can take me to that place of, I don't know if you're really going to have my back. I don't know yeah. if you're going to show up like you say you are to a place where I'm like, oh yeah, he's going to show up even if, even yeah. if we're like sketchy, right, right. <laughs> you know? So, so please don't stop because at this moment you feel like you're not brave enough like Melody is because I was not brave enough hmm. either. Yeah, that's good. You know? So, so the story. Yeah. And I've been thinking about this and my, my, the story I want to share is about this young girl in this club. And, um, oh man, she was, she was young. So we had Mm. gotten into the club and, and God was kind of just, uh, making her stand out to me. Mm -hmm. And I, I kept kind of missing her. I was talking to one lady she walked by and I noticed her another noticed. And then finally towards the end, right before we were about to leave, I actually was able to strike up a conversation with her. And so she goes into her story and, and she starts telling me how like one, she, she was like, I really don't, I don't like working here. I don't want to work here. And, um, and wow. I, I have these dreams, like I really want a baby. I want a family, wow. but I feel like I'm going to, like, I think it was like, I'm going to die in this car crash. And she just had this whole, just 
horrible ending that she just bought into and yeah. was convinced. Yeah. I could literally feel the fear just, just coming off of her. This, because I, I have this young girl standing here and she's just telling me all this and I can feel this presence of fear. It just, it gave me like this holy anger. I was yeah, like, yeah. oh no. Yeah. You know? So I just start telling her like, Jesus can take all that fear away. Jesus has destiny. Jesus wants you to have that family. Jesus wants you to have that baby. Yeah. As I'm saying this, you could really feel the atmosphere change. She starts crying. She starts sweating like God is all over this. Yeah. And so we go into the prayer. I lead her in a prayer to give her life to Jesus. Then I start just, I'm like, you now, now that you've given your life to Jesus, you just stand there and receive, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to break off every fear mm. that has attached itself to you. So I just go into this prayer, and God just shows up. She's crying. She's <laughs> shaking. She's sweating. It looks like a Pentecostal altar. Yeah. I don't even care. <laughs> like, like I'm getting all Pentecostal there. Yeah. I don't normally do that. I try yeah. to like yeah, keep yeah. it keep rain it, it in a little bit. Yeah, yeah I yeah. was totally not raining it yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Adam knows. Adam knows that I can yeah, yeah. not rain it in. <laughs> but we finished up praying yeah. and she's laughing and she's crying and she keeps going, I'm so sweaty. I'm so sweaty. No, I know I keep pointing it, that out, but you have to understand it. it's in the back of these, this room, it's cold. And this whole thing is going down and she has like next to nothing on. No clothes on basically. <laughs> yeah. Like, right. No, You're in a strip club. Yeah. 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 Really no clothes on. Right. <laughs> and so. Now, so I, I told her, like, if she needed anything, she could contact Elijah Rise and they would be able to get a hold of me. And I just prayed for her fervently for quite some time. Yeah. I have never seen her again. Mm. As much as my heart would love to see her again, I haven't, but I'm okay with that. Hmm. Wow. You know, a lot of times you go in there and and you you meet with these girls and you you share in that encounter of God's love with them but you don't want to see them again. Mm. You know, sometimes you do. Like I had one girl come in and she was like, remember me? And I was like, ah, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but it had been months and months since I had seen her, Yeah. but I have never seen her again. And I hope to never see her again. Why is I, that Melody? Why? Because I want to believe that that seed, that moment was a catalyst and a, a redirection. Yeah in her life. And she's got a baby somewhere and she's living a different life and she's healthy and she's yes. whole. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and God is a good shepherd and mm. they're his sheep. Yeah. And so I have to trust her to him. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it doesn't mean yeah. I stop praying, you know, um, uh, I, I won't go into another story, yeah. but, <laughs> but, but we do want to keep them yeah. in our prayers even after. Yeah. And I think that, you know, you, again, you, 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 one of the things I think you're saying without actually saying is like, it's not really our goal to go out on intervention and like encounter someone, you know, lead them to salvation and get them to exit. And then we like, like we remain that person for them. We actually, or like, it's not about us. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Like, it's not about our fulfillment. Yes. It, it's not about our reward. It's not about our win. It's not about our um, success, mm -hmm. but it's really about being that. I think what I hear you saying is it's about being that vehicle to discern, to see. Cause another thing you said there that stood out to me was like, you saw her, mm -hmm. like you were able to see her and so many individuals that are being victimized by commercial sexual exploitation. They're not seen by society. Mm -hmm. They're not seen by the church. In yeah. many cases, they're not seen by anyone. They're used, they're abused, mm -hmm. uh, they're products. And so you kept saying like, she would walk by and I would see her and I would mm -hmm. see her. Like you saw her as a person, you saw her as a child, you saw mm -hmm. her um, as someone made in the image of God. You saw her as someone worthy of pursuing, mm -hmm. spending time with, and not reining it in with for a <laughs> while. And it, I just found it so poignant that at the end of your story, it's like, I hope I never see her again. <laughs> and I know what you mean by that. What you mean is like, well, it's not about Melody, mm -hmm. and I hope I never see her in that club again. I hope all those things, all those dreams in her heart um, come to fruition because, because God has done a work that yes. that moment was significant. Such a powerful story. I know that you can tell us a million, <laughs> but we do need to wrap this up. Mm -hmm. So the last question I have for you is 
I wonder if someone who has so much experience in this, mm -hmm. done it for so long, and I know I've seen you take uh, brand new volunteers out. Mm -hmm. I've seen you go out with veterans um, and, and you know this field. What do you think is maybe one of the biggest misconceptions about doing anti-sex trafficking outreach? What do you think, you know, I think we talked about a little bit, like maybe some people are thinking like, I could never do that. But what do you, what do you think the biggest misconception is? It's a waste of time. It's a waste of it's time. It's unfruitful. Mm. Because you, and, and I totally disagree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Completely Same. disagree for the record. <laughs> But um, with this style of outreach and intervention, it's it's hard. Yeah, for you sure. Know? You know, you have sure. to go with love and patience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't always see like the the fruit of it. Yeah. Of of what seeds you've been planting. What what like hey, you know, there's a different way. There's a different way. You have to give room for these people whose lives have been so just. Uh, traumatized, shattered, and, yes. Yeah, yeah. To to start to think about like, wow, maybe there is. You have to give them that room to start to build trust sure. in what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. You know, so a lot of times people will um, they'll go and they'll go and they'll get disheartened. Mm. You know, because you that's one story out of maybe quite a few where it just seemed like nothing. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? It's if you can hold on to those stories, like I, I, I've been doing this type of ministry for a long time. And yes, sometimes you're like, am I doing any good God? Mm. But then you have this moment like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it just, it, it's enough. You know, one soul is enough. It's enough, man. You know? So I would say, take that thought process and toss it in the garbage. Because if we do this for years and years and years and only one person gets out and gets um, healed and restored, then by God's standard, it's enough. It was worth it all. It was worth it all. Yeah. That is so important what you've just said, you know, cause that is one of the questions that we get like, Oh wow. Like you're running, you know, 40, 50, you know, volunteers out in the streets every single week. Like how many women exited? It's like, Oh, well maybe one, you know, or maybe none this week, maybe none this month, maybe three this month. And when and I, we do have that question. It's like, well, well, like, well, is it effective? Like, is your strategy working? Like, are you wasting your time? Could you be putting your time, your effort, your money into doing something different that would be more effective? And I think the way you just answered that misconception is so important because it's not about the numbers. It's about the faithfulness. It's about those seeds and it's about the resources. And the truth is like, sometimes we don't know, maybe there were 30 exits that night, but we don't know. Maybe they waited a week and they, you know, chose another way to exit. Like we can never know that information. And so another thing you've said that I kind of circle, want to circle back to is like, we have to be willing to trust God exactly with, with all of this, whether it's walking into a dark room or trusting, you know, that that woman that we encountered is going to exit. It's the Holy Spirit who who stirs the heart. Sure, yeah. We're just simply walking with him, partnering with him, and saying yes to being that that hands and feet. Yeah, yeah. I, it's not my job yeah. to change someone's heart. I can only carry a message of hope. And that takes a lot of pressure off of me. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody can do that. Anybody can do that. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us on the podcast today, Melody. I look forward to uh, many more conversations with you in the future. Hey, thank you for tuning in to the Elijah Rising podcast today. If you found any value in this content, we ask that you would help further our work by subscribing to this channel and liking this video. As well, we would love to know what you think. So go ahead and comment below if you have any thoughts or reactions or questions. We read them all and we'll respond to as many as we can. Thanks again for viewing and we'll see you on the next episode of the Elijah Rising podcast.